Hi, welcome back. In this session, I'd like to talk about Facebook. The company has been in the news for the last couple of weeks for all the wrong reasons. But rather than focus on its last earnings report, which was a disappointment, and that's an understatement, I want to use the disappointments at Facebook as an entry point to talk about bigger issues. In this particular post, I want to focus on one of those big issues, which is corporate governance. Now, corporate governance happens to be one of those things we forget about in the good times, but we wake up to it in bad times. So I want to talk about why corporate governance is now back in the news, how I think it's been misunderstood, and what we need to think about in the context of corporate governance going forward. So let's set the stage. This year has not been a good year for tech, and particularly so for big tech. The Fangam stocks, and we've been so used to seeing them beat expectations and go up hundreds of billions of dollars over the last few years, are suddenly disappointing us. Earnings reports, which always included better than expected numbers, are now including worse than expected numbers. And Facebook seems to be in the eye of the storm. It's actually down 75% from the trillion dollar market cap, in fact, more than 75% from the trillion dollar market cap it enjoyed in July of 2021. That was only, what, 15, 16 months ago? And in the last earnings report, Facebook managed to disappoint almost every segment of the market. Growth investors were disappointed because for the first time in its history, Facebook reported revenues were down. Forget about low growth, they reported negative growth. Now, Facebook has always been a cash machine. You say, well, value investors might like it now, right? But in their most recent earnings report, Facebook reported a significant drop, a steep drop in their operating margins. So growth has gone away and margins are down. No wonder everybody's turning on Facebook. But as I said, I don't want to focus the next, this session on the Facebook earnings numbers. I'll talk about why they were so disappointing and perhaps a little bit about Facebook's valuation. But there are three big issues that I think come to the surface with the Facebook earnings report that are broader issues. The first is the issue of corporate governance. Who runs a company and for whom? How much power do shareholders have in a company? I'll talk about how we have lost our way on corporate governance, the way we measure it, the way we research it, and what we need to rediscover if we're going to think about corporate governance going forward. I also want to talk about accounting inconsistencies, especially when it comes to how accountants classify expenses into operating capital and financial expenses, and how those inconsistencies lead us sometimes to look at technology firms in ways we shouldn't be. And the third issue I want to talk about is storytelling. I think Facebook has lost its storyline. For a decade, it wrote the storyline of a user platform with incredible earning power. That story is going thin. I know Facebook has plans to go in the metaverse, but they haven't done a good job of at least giving us a narrative of what exactly they plan to do in the metaverse. So as I said, this particular session is going to be focused on corporate governance. And to talk about why it's back in the news, I'm going to show what Facebook has done over its lifetime. Remember, Facebook is a young company. In chronological year, its chronological age, it's about a decade old. It went public in 2012. And what a ride it's been. This graph shows you Facebook's entire market history from the day of its IPO in May of 2012, all the way through October 27th of 2022. The company went public with a market cap of 104 billion. At that time, it was greeted as one of the largest IPOs of all time. And over the next two months, it collapsed, it imploded. Its stock price halved over the next two months. August of 2022, the market cap was down to 50 billion. Since then though, it's been a ride up. For much of the last decade, Facebook was one of the great winners. It added $950 billion in market cap between its low point in August of 2012 to the end of 2020 leading into COVID. In fact, July of 2021, the stock hit an all-time high when its market cap exceeded a trillion dollars. It became one of those 
select few companies and you could count them on your on, on one hand, perhaps you need a second hand, now five, six companies that have hit trillion dollar market caps. That was July 2021. Look at how steeply it's fallen since. By October 2022, it had lost more than 75% of its market cap. It's still a large market cap company at 250 billion, but a much smaller company in market cap terms than it used to be. I've learned that when you have big moves in stock prices, sometimes it's good to step back and gain perspective. So a couple of questions I asked about Facebook. One is, if I'd bought Facebook shares on the day of their IPO and held them all the way through October 27th of 2022, what kind of return would I have made? I'll give you the good news. The good news is you'd have had a price appreciation of 144%. Now, before you celebrate, though, remember the S&P 500 was up 181% over that period. And if you incorporate dividends, which you have none in Facebook and about 2% a year in the S&P 500, a buy and hold strategy on Facebook where you bought the company on the day of its IPO and held it through October 27th of 2022 would have been a losing strategy. Still, though, it's got a $250 billion market cap, putting it among the large market cap companies. But it's lost its standing as one of the largest market cap companies in the world. Now, along the way, though, as you saw in that chart, there have been up day, up, move, up periods and down periods. And a trader in Facebook, if you timed your entry and exit, could have become really rich on the stock. Think so what? When you look at Facebook's history, there are a couple of things that I think you can take away. One is... It's very dangerous to pass premature judgment on a company two, three, four, even five years into its tenure in markets and say that company is successful or a failure because sometimes it can take a longer period for that to play out. The second is there are some stocks which are traders' playgrounds. Investors don't belong and Facebook happens to be one of those stocks. This is a stock that's been dominated by traders for much of its lifetime. And that might explain some of the reaction you're seeing to its earnings report. But more on that on a, in a different session. In this one, I want to also focus on Facebook's operating history. Now, normally when you think about tech companies, you think about revenue scaling up, but big losses, right? You're thinking about young tech companies. Facebook has been anything but that stereotype. This is a company that's been a money machine from day one. Its revenues were only about $3 billion when it went public, but was already making money, not just making money, but making money hand over fist, an operating margin in excess of 40%. Through much of its life, this is a company that has managed to deliver 35 to 40% operating margins. This is a company that's been immensely profitable from day one in public markets. Along the way, especially in the first few years, it's scaled up. By the time you get to 2022, the revenues were in excess of 100 billion. This is a company that has been able to increase its revenues more than 30 fold while remaining profitable along the way. So before you use the last nine months to pass judgment on Facebook as a company, its so operating results are pretty good, right? Until you get to the last quarter. So you know, what, what happened in the last quarter? Well, if you look at the third quarter, and it's not just the third quarter. Much of this year, Facebook's earnings reports have been disappointing. But the third quarter of 2022 crystallized those disappointments. First, you had flat revenues. The revenues were down relative to the same quarter in the previous year. And we're heading towards a year where the total revenues for Facebook will probably, probably be down for the first time in their history. We'll talk about what might be happening that's causing revenues to flatten or become, you know, or, or drop. But clearly, that disappointed a lot of investors. But I think if that's all the earnings report had included, slowing growth, investors, or even flat and slightly negative growth, investors would have been okay with it. But in conjunction with, with, with that drop in revenues, the company also reported a steep drop in profitability. Their operating margins dropped down to 21%. That's the lowest margin they've had in their history. Now, of course, Facebook 
gave a reason. It said that one of its divisions, the one that makes the virtual reality glasses, reality labs, had revenues of only 285 million for the quarter and expenses in ex excess of three and a half billion. And the story makes it actually makes sense, right? They're saying, look, we're going to be in the metaverse. This is our entree into the metaverse. That's why we're investing. Investors were in no mood for that rationale. We'll come back and talk about what Facebook could have done better to frame that story, but they did not. The bottom line is this was an earnings report that disappointed everybody. But let's step back. If you look at Facebook's history, it's had challenges. A few years ago, that challenge was the privacy problem, which is the 2018 Cambridge Analytica scandal, where Cambridge Analytica, a consulting firm that had political clients, business clients, it turned out that they'd been using Facebook data on people to target their, 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 their advertising. And this was data that was private. That blew up in, in, as, as a huge scandal in 2018. If you remember, Facebook's stock price fell pretty steeply when that happened. At that time, I took issue with the drop in the price saying, this is hypocritical. The people who are complaining about Facebook's invasion of privacy are complaining on their Facebook pages. And my view was, hey, if that's the way you're going to be fighting Facebook, Facebook is going to end up you know, getting out of this crisis and they did, they bounced back. It didn't mean, doesn't mean they didn't have any damage that came out of that privacy scandal. But that scandal, they've managed to navigate pretty well. But there are three bigger challenges that I think are challenges that are not going to go away that easily. The first is Facebook, through its entire life, has been an online advertising company. It gets almost all of its revenues from online advertising. Think so what? If you look at the first part of the last decade, 2010, 2011, 2012, no, early on, the advantage of being an online advertising company and being good at it was that this was a growing market. And think of why it was growing. It was growing because it was taking away market share from traditional advertisers, newspapers, TV. Facebook benefited from a growing market. In fact, Facebook and Google benefited so much, they've ended up dominating the online advertising market. And online advertising has done so well, it's now two thirds of all of advertising. You think, where's this going? Well, advertising is an expense to companies. It can't grow 15, 20% a year. So now that online advertising is the bulk of the advertising market, and you've got the two biggest players in it, in Facebook and Google, you can see growth is going to slow down no matter what. The second big challenge, and this was, I think, something we knew was coming, but we didn't know what the answer would be, is there was talk early on in the online advertising, when online advertising was growing, about maybe online advertising would be more resilient to economic showdowns than traditional advertising. Well, 2022 has kind of answered that question, right? The question is, is online advertising cyclical? The 2022 answer is absolutely. It's like all other advertising. So the online ad market is leveling off. It is a cyclical market. And while Facebook was able to get through the privacy scandal relatively unscathed in economic terms, its reputation took a beating. In fact, remember last year when they changed their name, they gave a reason for it. They said, we're interested in entering a new market, the metaverse, that's why we're calling ourselves meta. Well, that might have been the case, but to me, companies don't give up a name that they've spent a decade making one of the most widely recognized names in the world. You don't give that up. The only reason I could think of why they would give up the name is for whatever reason, the name had become toxic. A leveling of online advertising market which is now cyclical and a name that is contaminated. These are not problems that are going to disappear overnight. So in this context that I want to talk about corporate governance, as I said, in good times, we forget about corporate governance. In bad times, we talk about it, but often we miss the boat in what exactly corporate governance is. To understand why, what governance is and why it matters, I'm gonna step back and talk about the numerous stakeholders in a publicly traded company. Of course, you've got shareholders who invest in the equity of the company. 
You got lenders, bondholders, and banks who lent to the company. You got you've got customers who buy the company's products and services. You got employees who work for the company. You got the government as a player, collecting taxes from you, putting rules and regulations you got to follow. And you even have competitors who fight for the same markets that you do. They're all potentially stakeholders, right? And at the center of all of this are the people who make decisions in the company, the corporate managers. Now, there are cases where the shareholders are the corporate managers, but it's entirely conceivable that in a company, the people making the decisions of the company are not the shareholders, they're just managers. These are the stakeholders in a company. Now, in traditional corporate finance, one of these stakeholders is put on top of the pile. It's shareholders, right? And it's not just traditional corporate finance. The Delaware courts reinforce it that if you're the manager of a company, the primacy has to be given to shareholders, their interests that come first. And of course, that makes some people upset because their view is, why are you viewing shareholders as a special or a protected group? But we're not. The reason shareholders are given primacy in corporate finance and corporate law is not because they're special people, but it's because they're the only stakeholder, stakeholder group that does not have a contractual claim on the company. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you're a lender, you lend money to a company, you set the interest rate, you set the terms of the loan, you write in covenants. In other words, contractually, you try to protect yourself. The fact that you don't do it well is really your fault. It's not the fault of the company or the shareholders. You think, what about employees? Well, employees enter into employment agreements with the company. They don't have to work for the company. If there's a union, the union steps in and puts in protections into the union contract. Again, a contractual claim in the company. Now, we can argue that those contractual claims that employees have have been weakened over the last 30 years. That's a different argument. But they are contractually connected to the company. Customers. When you buy a product, you have an implied contract, which is the company selling the product tells you what it's selling and you pay a price. And of course, the company's not keeping its, its end of the bargain. You can complain. You can return the product. The only group that gets a residual claim, whatever's left over, are shareholders. That's why we put them in top. Of course, there's this completely misguided notion that some people have called stakeholder wealth maximization. This, of course, this, this idea was born in, in law schools. And you can see that it was born in law schools because it's completely impractical. It's impractical because it assumes that you can keep everybody happy, that it's a manager's job to balance these interests and keep everybody happy. Only somebody who's never run a business, never had to make a business decision would think this is a good idea. And second, it's a dangerous notion because if you make managers accountable to everyone, which is what stakeholder wealth maximization tries to do, they're accountable to no one. They always use another interest group to explain why they did not take care of, uh, of each interest group. So shareholders say, why is our stock price down 30%? Managers say, well, that's because we had to take care of employees. Employees say, why are our wages down 20%? Well, that's because we have to take care of society. How convenient. I've had some terrible things to say about ESG. I'm not going to take any of them back. But the G in ESG has nothing to do with corporate governance. In fact, the G in ESG is about stakeholder you know, wealth maximization. And that's why CEOs love ESG, because it makes them accountable to no one. So with that backing, let's talk about what the conflicts of interest might be here. You got the owners of the company, shareholders in a public company, the, in, the owners of a company, a private company, and you got the people making decisions in the company. Now, if you're looking at a privately owned firm where there's a sole owner who runs a business, there is no conflict of interest, right? The owner is the decision maker. But that's the exception rather than the rule. Even family-owned businesses have conflicts of interest. Why? Because the family member who runs the business might run it in ways that the other family members don't like. You've seen uh, the HBO show Succession. If you haven't, take a look at what happens when you have a family-run business where family members disagree. 
And if it becomes a company that seeks out external capital from venture capitalists or from public market equity investors, the potential conflict gets worse, right? Because the people making the decisions and the people who supply them capital might have very different views on how to run the company. So let's talk about where the conflicts of interest are greatest. So if you think about the conflict of interest fundamentally is coming from decision makers running a company having interests very different from the people who supply capital, the people who, the owners of the business, you think there shouldn't be any when a company first goes public, right? Or when you have a private business. Well, not necessarily. If you have a private business, you raise money from venture capitalists, what's good for founders who might be running the company and what's good for venture capitalists might be very different. That's a conflict. If you become public and you're a founder who still owns a big chunk of the company, which is often the case of these big tech companies, you could argue that what's good for inside shareholders around the company can be very different from what's good for outside shareholders. As a company ages and its um, shareholding base gets more dispersed, what's good for the managers around the company who might be looking at their compensation packages and building empires might be very different than what's good for shareholders. So you can see the conflicts of interest both change and perhaps become greater as a company goes through the life cycle and ages. And when you have conflicts of interest, human nature wins out. What does that mean? Well, you're going to put your interests first. Now, you can tell me all the alt altruistic things you want about how you, you're going to put other people's interests first. But when push comes to shove, your interests are going to win out. In private businesses, this is what happens when founders do things that, are not, that make them better off, but are at the expense of venture capitalists. In public companies, what inside shareholders do to, as I said, advance their interests it can be very different than what outside shareholders want. And with public companies where you have dispersed shareholding, it gets even worse. Managerial interests can outweigh shareholder interests. Now, of course, there are checks on these conflicts of interest. They don't always work well. When private companies seek out venture capital, the venture capital investors know that there's a potential conflict of interest. So if they're sensible VC investors, they take an active role in management. You cannot be a passive venture capital investor and expect not to get surprised in negative ways. Not only do venture capitalists often actively get involved in management, if they have enough of a stake, they can actually push founders out if they feel founders are not doing what needs to be done to advance VC interests. In public companies, we have insiders and founders in charge. Early on, you have very little recourse as an outside shareholder other than to sell your shares and move on. But maybe within the insiders, you can have dissension that can cause this change, in, you know, checks on the conflicts of interest. And in large publicly traded companies with dispersed shareholding, you know who's supposed to protect the shareholders, right? The board of directors. God help us. Because in theory, the board of directors is there not to advance the interests of CEOs or to protect them, but to protect the interests of shareholders. So with that lead in, let's talk about corporate governance. About 20 plus years ago, in the aftermath of the Enron and the Tyco scandals in the U.S., Let's talk about we need to fix corporate governance because those were companies where insider dominated and passive boards allowed CEOs to do things that they shouldn't be doing. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act was passed and it had lots of objectives, one of which was better corporate governance. So it required disclosure, restrictions on having insiders, directors. At about the same time, you saw the entry and the, and the growth of services that measured corporate governance with a score. So you've got laws pushing forth better corporate governance. You've got services that are now measuring corporate governance. We were told in 2001 and 2002 after these changes that we'd fix corporate governance, that corporate governance was going to be better because of laws and because of the scores. 20 years later, I'd like you to take a look at where we are and ask whether independent boards, you know, hundreds of pages of disclosure and corporate governance scores have improved corporate governance or made it worse. I'm going to argue that in the process of doing all of this, we become so distracted by small things, 
we've allowed some really big changes in corporate governance that have made it weaker to slip through. Now, of course, you know, what I think, um, what I think the, co the original corporate governance revolutionaries, the people who wrote those laws missed, was they thought that if they could just make the board of directors more independent, they would have more effective boards. You know what I think they've done? They've replaced ineffective insider boards with the ineffective outsider boards. And of course, there's a big push towards diversity as being the next big thing with the board of directors. I'm going to be cynical here. I'm going to argue that if all, after all of this is said and done, the NASDAQ is making a move to make boards more diverse. The SEC is making its own moves. You know what we're going to end up with? We're going to end, still end up with incredibly ineffective boards. The only saving grace is they'll be very diverse, ineffective boards. Maybe that's the end game, is have boards that look like they're independent and diverse, not effective boards. So I'm going to step back and argue that corporate governance has to be thought about differently. Corporate governance is not about whether you have nine directors or 11 directors, whether they're insiders or outsiders. It's about the power to change company management if you're the owner of a company. Shareholders. It's the power to change management if they choose to. In fact, I think there are a lot of parallels between corporate governance and democracies. I mean, remember, in a good democracy, what do you get? You get a chance to change the government by voting against it. A chance. Will you take the chance? Maybe not. Maybe you will. And when you take the chance, maybe you'll replace a good government with a bad government. Democracies don't guarantee good governments. They just give you the right to change governments. Corporate governance is very much the same. Corporate governance does not guarantee good management. It just gives shareholders a chance to change management. And sometimes they will do it for all the wrong reasons. And sometimes they will not do it even though it should be done. So it's all about changing management. You think, why would I want to change management? I think the best way to understand why you might need to change management is to look at companies through a structure I've used before, corporate life cycle. Corporate life cycle companies are, go from being babies, startups, to toddlers, very young companies, to teenagers, very high growth companies, to middle age, mature companies, and then into old age. The type of management you want at each stage will depend on the skill set I need the most at that stage. If you're a startup, you, you know who you need as your CEO or top management, right? People who are visionaries, who can tell stories, who can inspire investors and employees to follow along. The next phase, your job is to convert that idea into a product and a market. You need pragmatists. You know what happens to purist founders who insist that they will never compromise? they end up in the dustbin of businesses, of, tra of failed businesses. You need a pragmatist. Visionary, who's still pragmatic, willing to make the adjustments or compromises to convert idea to product, product to market. In the third phase, you need a person who can build a business. And building businesses is 95% perspiration, right? Who really wants to sit on a three-hour supply chain meeting? I don't. But if you're building a business, you can't just be selling vision. You've got to be sitting in on three-hour supply chain meetings. You need a business builder. And then you get into mature growth. You're now a big company. You still want to grow. I mean, you know, want somebody who's opportunistic, who can find new markets, new ways of using a product to continue the growth rate. And then when you become a mature, stable company, you want somebody who can play good defense against companies coming after your market. And in decline, you want the exact opposite of the person you wanted to start up. You do not want visionaries running declining companies. You want realist, hard-nosed about the end game here, which is not sustaining a company that should not be sustained and perhaps accepting liquidation as the best outcome if that is the best thing you can do for your shareholders. The qualities we need in top management will shift as the company moves through the life cycle. I'll come back and connect this to corporate governance, but you can already see how you can end up with mismatches. If you have a startup run by a somebody with no vision, 
or somebody who, or a you know business that, um, or you're trying to build into a business, but you're run by a person who has all vision, no business building skills, you got a mismatch. If you're a um, high growth company and uh, you keep going for growth and you forget that you have to build up, the, you're, you're mismatched. In a mature company, somebody has visions of grandeur that they can make the company grow at 20%, you got a mismatch. You can have management get mismatched with companies. And remember, it can happen for lots of different reasons. One is that the company changes, but the management doesn't. So you have a startup with a visionary. They matched up, right? But as you go through time, the startup becomes a young business, but the visionary doesn't develop business building skills. You got a mismatch because the company has aged out, but the manager hasn't. You can get a mismatch because of a hiring mistake. A board of directors at a mature company who goes and hires a person who's a liquidator. It might not be the right skill set. You hired the wrong person. It could even be hopeful thinking, and I've seen this particularly with declining companies. I saw it at Yahoo, now I'm seeing it at Bed Bath and beyond, where boards of directors seem to have this delusional thinking that if they just hire the right visionary, their declining company will become a startup again. Nice if it happens, but it almost never does. So mismatches can happen at companies, and if they're not fixed, there can be consequences. The consequences can sometimes be benign. You're saying, how can you have mismatch management and benign consequences? Because some mismatch managers realize they're mismatched. You know what they do? They ask for help. I, you know, I, I think of Steve Jobs in his first iteration as CEO of Apple. I am old enough to have been an investor in Apple when Steve Jobs was CEO in his first round in the 1980s and 90s. The man was a visionary, but he was headstrong. I owned the Lisa, one of the worst designed computers of all time, because he was so set on how a computer should be designed that he refused to accept feedback. He almost ruined the company. He, of course, put, got pushed out. He came back again, and it was the second coming of Steve Jobs that he became legendary, right? You saying what was different the second time around? One is he was older. The second was he'd built a company, Pixar, while he was away. The third was, and this I think was, was, was very significant, is he had a chief operating officer named Tim Cook, a man without a visionary bone in his body, but a man who knew how to, run, how to make the trains run on time. And you got to give Steve Jobs credit. He basically said, I'll take care of the vision thing. You take care of the operating part of the business. We'll be a good team. And they were. That's a benign scenario. The intermediate scenario is you have a mismatched CEO. The board kind of does not do much about it. The mismatch lasts for a while until finally you say, this isn't working. But by the time you come to that recognition, significant damage has been done. And there's a third and a final scenario, the most malignant scenario, where the mismatch continues into perpetuity and the manager runs the company into the ground. Mismatches are a problem and corporate governance is the solution. So let's talk about this life cycle. Now, one of the things that separates human life cycles from corporate life cycles is human life cycles have a fixed span, right? I mean, you don't get people living for 300 years. And if people die before the age of 30 or 25, you know that something bad happened. Corporate life cycles don't follow chronological patterns. The, uh, the oldest company, and to my knowledge, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is a small privately owned Japanese company that lasted 1,600 years. They built um, temples and shrines, 1,600 years. They were finally acquired in 2006, 1,600 years. At the other extreme, you have companies that are shooting stars. They zoom, they're incredibly successful, they stay at the top very little for a very little time, and then they decline very quickly, 15, 20 years. You're saying, what sets them apart? I think when you look at life cycles, what determines how long or how steep a life cycle is, are a couple of things. One is how much access you have to capital, how big the market you're going after is, and how easy it is to scale up. How low capital intensity businesses can scale up much better than high capital intensity businesses. It took the railroads a hundred years to go from small to large. 
It can take a software company five years to make that same leap. He's saying, I'd rather be a software company than a railroad. Be careful what you wish for. Because companies that are able to scale up quickly because they have access to capital, they're attacking a market where, you know, where scaling up is easy, they'll have trouble staying at the top for very long. And when they go into decline, they'll decline quickly because the same forces that allow them to grow quickly will also allow competitors to come in. This was the basis for an argument I made a few years ago that tech companies age in dog years. What does that mean? Think about the great companies of the 20th century. G, Ford, Exxon, Mobil. Companies are all more than 100 years old. They took a long time to go from being small to large. They stayed at the top for decades and then they went into declines. The declines were gradual over time. So think of this life cycle as the 20th century non-tech company. And then think of Yahoo, founded in 1994, became a billion, $100 billion market cap company in 1999, five years later, from nothing to $100 billion, lasted at the top for about five years until Google came along, and then went into a steep decline. And by 2017, the company was dead, 23 years from start to finish compressed life cycles. These things, so what? When your life cycle is compressed, those mismatches we talked about are going to become far more frequent, and here's why. If you take a company like Ford, the early days of Ford's life, it was run by Henry Ford, a visionary but a crank. I mean, we all celebrate the Model T because it made mass market automobiles a possibility, but remember, he sold it in only one color, black. Why? Because that's what he thought a car should look like. He was the right person to run Ford in its early years, but even by the time he got to the 30s, in the 1930s, he was already, this crank side was starting to become much more significant. But you know what? Time took care of the problem. 1945, he handed over, because he was, you know, he was old, he could not do this anymore. He handed over the, 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 the stewardship of Ford to his grandson, Henry Ford II. The transition was made. For companies with long life cycles, time takes care of transitions. In contrast, think of BlackBerry, a company that came out of nowhere. The two Canadians who founded the company, Bacillus and I don't forget the name of the other, the other gentleman, were hailed as visionaries because they grew the company from nothing to this huge success in a phase of five, six, seven years. But then Apple entered the smartphone market, other smartphone manufacturers came in and BlackBerry just did not know how to respond. And the same two men were still in charge of BlackBerry while well, it went from being a successful company to a nothing. In other words, when life cycles are compressed, you're going to often see cases where CEOs were celebrated as amazing CEOs are now going to be mismatches because the company has changed under them. So management mismatches are going to be more common at these compressed life cycle firms. And since the bulk of the firms we're seeing hit the market now have compressed life cycles, well, guess what? We're going to see more market management mismatches going forward. But here's the irony. The need for corporate governance is greater at these firms than at the firms of the 20th century, right? But you know what we've done over the last 20 years? We've given up the power to create change. We'll talk about why this might happen. Make no sense at all, given that the kinds of companies that are going public now are exactly the companies we want to preserve the right to be able to change management. We've given up the right. You're saying in what way? This is a graph that looks at the percentage of IPOs each year, which have two classes of shares with different voting rights. You know how this works, right? Company goes public, it issues one class to the public, and another class is retained by the founder and the insiders. The public get the shares with either no or low voting rights. The founders keep the high voting right shares. The system is fixed. It's fixed in favor of incumbents, and we've allowed this to happen. The companies where change is most needed are companies where we've given up the right to create that change. 
that is a real problem. And you can see it play out in Facebook. Facebook has two classes of shares. Class A shares, which is the shares that you and I buy when we buy shares in Facebook, have one vote. Class B shares have 10 votes. The bulk of the Class B shares are held by Mark Zuckerberg. How does this play out? With about 13.5% of all outstanding shares in Facebook, you had the Class A and the Class B shares, Zuckerberg controls 57% of the voting rights. This isn't a democracy, unless you describe North Korea as a democracy. If there's an election here, it's only because you know what the outcome is going to be. This is an autocracy, and Mark Zuckerberg is on top, but investors allowed this to happen. So I'm going to name culprits. The first, of course, were exchanges seeking market share. You know the reason U.S. companies avoided issuing two classes of shares in the 20th century? Because the New York Stock Exchange, which was the exchange that companies aspired to end up on, did not allow dual-class shares, starting in about 1940. In fact, for the bulk of the century, there were a few companies that were grandfathered in, but companies were not allowed to have dual-class shares and stay listed in the New York. And that was enough to stop most companies. The Amex loosened the rules, but the NASDAQ really went to town. They removed all rules. You know why? Because they wanted tech companies listing on them. And boy, has it worked well for them in terms of market share. The biggest tech companies in the world are on the NASDAQ. Along the way, though, these companies had another thing working in their favor, which is founder worship. For a few decades now, we worshipped the people who create these tech companies. Maybe that worship is starting to shake up a little bit, but we view these people as super normal people, much smarter than the average person, much more long-term thinking. We attributed powers to them that no human being can really be allowed to have. So when Google went public, we said, those guys are so smart, Sergey Brin, Larry Page. It doesn't matter if I have power. They're going to do the right thing when Mark Zuckerberg went public. That guy's so smart. He wears a hoodie. He's got an IQ, I'm sure, of 250. He knows how to run the company. Founder worship has essentially allowed these tech companies to pull a fast one on us because we've willingly given up our saying, hey, it doesn't matter. If you go back to the, de the democracy analogy I offered, we thought we were buying into benevolent dictatorships with these companies and we signed our rights away. And we can't avoid responsibility as investors, right? We bought the shares of these companies. Those institutional investors and retail investors who bought the shares in the IPO, were they even thinking about the fact that they were buying shares with lesser voting rights? I don't think so. When I hear institutional investors complain about the fact, especially now with Facebook, that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't seem to be listening to them, my reaction is, hey, that's like getting married to one of the Kardashians and complaining about the invasion of privacy that you're going through. You get what you deserve. Now, of course, you're saying, where were the regulators? Because, you know, we want regulators to protect us from our own stupidities, right? Why didn't the SEC ban it? I have some sympathy for your argument. I think the SEC should have done something earlier. But guess what? Even if they'd banned dual-class shares, all of the other things would have still stayed in place. We'd still have been lazy. We'd still have worshipped these founders. We'd have found a different way to give away our powers. The fault doesn't lie in our stars. It lies in ourselves. We get the companies we deserve, and we're getting the corporate governance of tech companies we, in a sense, paid for. But I'll make some predictions because this mismatch combined with the fact that we have no power, is going to play out in pretty ugly ways. In some tech companies, change will come. But the change will come in spite of the fact that founders and insiders have kind of loaded the game in their favor. It will probably come because of insider intrigue. One insider turns against another insider. I know the Twitter deal is a one-time deal and Elon Musk is a one-time acquirer. But the chaos you're seeing 
in the Twitter change of management is chaos you should get ready to see in many other tech companies when change comes. The second is in companies where change doesn't come, we're going to lock in mismatches. What does that mean? You're going to have CEOs are absolutely unsuited to run the companies they're running and there's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. As an investor, as somebody valuing companies, you know how this plays out. Normally when companies adopt bad practices in valuation, you assume that they will fix them over time. Why? Because they get feedback, they get push again, pushback, they get pressure from shareholders. So if you have low margins in a sector where others have high margins, over time you assume that the company will fix its problems, improve its margins. If it's taking projects that earn less than the cost of capital, you assume that will stop. But what if you have a founder CEO that will never leave? Those bad practices are not going to go away. You know what you need to do in valuation? Assume that the company, if it's destroying value, will keep destroying value. That's going to push down the value of the company. But you've got to face reality. And finally, as I said, most of these companies are voting and non-voting shares. And for those companies where both are traded, historically, the price difference has been very small. I think you're going to see price differences widen, especially at companies where people don't trust the management. We're going to recognize the value of control by giving voting shares a premium. Testable hypotheses. We'll see if it happens. So the bottom line is that corporate governance is all our problems. Worrying about it after bad things have happened is like bolting a barn after the horse has left. We need to worry about corporate governance when times are good. So we'll come back and talk about more issues related to Facebook, but I hope you found this session useful and thank you very much for listening.